Thank you. Thank you, Rory, for that uh, introduction. And thank you for Wad to Wadham for inviting me as well to talk about what is definitely one of Wren's <coughs> lesser known legacies, if you like, his theory that what we call the Gothic style should rightly be called the Saracen style. And remember, he came to that conclusion aged 81 was when he first mentioned it. In the Parentalia, he mentions it no less than 12 times. And so a man like Wren, as we've heard from this morning, is not going to come up with a theory like that out of nowhere. This, this is a man who investigates, who explores, who analyzes, and his considered opinion at the end of his life, in his final decade, was that Gothic derives from what is called Saracen. Saracen being the language of the 17th century to refer to all Arab Muslims. The word Muslim was not, was not in use then, so it's Saracens. So this is something I've been familiar with uh, most of my life because uh, I grew up in, in, in Europe, had been lucky enough to study Arabic and travel extensively uh, across the Arab world, and I've seen it for myself. So I've always known this theory to be accurate, but it somehow got buried as, and, and I feel in this year above all that perhaps it's time that Wren's theory had, has a bit more um, influence. And so I was drawn to write a book about, about this. The first two chapters are entirely about Wren and I explain there exactly what kind of a man he was and how incredibly open he was to all influences, no matter where it came from. And this is what's so remarkable about him, as has been referred to before. He was open to everything. As long as it was the best and interesting, he was prepared to take it in and synthesize it into something new. And one of the things I learned um, in my researches was that he happened to be here, Wren, at a time when Arabic was just getting going. So, Archbishop Lord, who was the Chancellor of Oxford at that time, decreed that all ships, uh, British ships heading to the Eastern Mediterranean should come back with at least one Arabic manuscript. So that started to happen. The Bodleian started to build up quite an impressive collection and Archbishop Lord set up the first chair of Arabic, the Lordian Professorship of Arabic. And Wren was here to benefit from that. And and what's more, um, Lord made it compulsory for all medical students and Bachelor of Arts students to attend the lectures. <laughs> Whether they did or not, we don't know, obviously. <laughs> um, but so Lord was very alive to the knowledge that was residing in the Arab world, the Islamic world, that they could benefit from here. And he was determined to bring some of that here because of all these lost translations. Uh, where, where in, in the Dark Ages, these, the, the original translations of many Greek works um, were, were lost. And the gentleman on the other side is Edward Pocock, who was the greatest Arab scholar of his time, and Lord appointed him to be the first professor. And Pocock had learned his Arabic after six years as a chaplain in Aleppo. After he was appointed, uh, the very first thing he did actually was to disappear to Constantinople for three years. <laughs> but when he came back, he, was, he coincided with Wren here, and there are records that indicate that Wren and Pocock would discuss many things in the early coffee shops that were just beginning to open in, in, uh, in Oxford. Because remember, this is at, at a time and, and Wren's theory, we must remember, is pretty revolutionary because it's at a time when the Ottomans were pressing at the gates of Vienna in 1683. So Wren was always happy to look for knowledge, even if it was supposedly from, from the enemy. So in, in his references to Saracen architecture, he identifies a handful of buildings as being of the Saracenic style. One of them he identifies is St. Mark's in, in Venice, and he correctly identifies there the what are called Islamic double domes, where the outer exterior is different to the interior and there's a hollow space in the middle. That is an Islamic invention. And when uh, Wren built St. Paul's, he actually goes one further 
and makes it into a, a triple dome. And so he, and, and the knowledge that he uses is actually from one of the texts that has been translated called the conics. The, the theory of cones and how they distribute weight is one of the key things that he says he uses at St. Paul's. He said, I used Saracen vaulting in the dome of St. Paul's because it was the best. That's, that's all he was interested in, the best, because he was always going to build for eternity. That was his, his motto all the time. So he was alive as well to the uh, uh, Constantinople at the time. He, he wanted to learn from, from the mosques everywhere. And of course, the great architect here, who was building mosques like the Suleymaniye, Sinan, the court architect, was actually 150 years ahead of Wren. And yet, he, Sinan lived to be 100. He built over 300 monuments compared to Wren's, you know, 50 and plus a few palaces. Um, but the level of, of vaulting that he uses there, again, is something that Wren uses, the use of pendentives, the use of semidones supporting the main, the main dome. So Wren is always asking his friends who do travel, he doesn't go anywhere except to Paris uh, to escape the plague, actually, for those six months he went and then he came back again, but he was always asking friends who traveled to bring him back more material. And, and the auction uh, records of his library after his death show that it was stuffed full of uh, travel books with illustrations. This is what he was reading and digesting all the time. So he was very, very alive to this. And he would have, if he'd ever had the chance to go and meet somebody like Sinan and see this mosque, he, he, he would have been astonished as well at how forward-looking somebody like Sinan was because Sinan was also an environmentalist who designed that dome in such a way that when the candles uh, and the, the, the oil lamps and the candles, all the soot went up into the dome and was funneled through water. It produced an ink that was used for calligraphy that had insect repellent qualities. You know, this is, this is 17th century, I mean, well, this was, no, this was 16th century recycling flair that, that we could perhaps all learn something from. Um, and it's been mentioned, I think, that uh, Wren was keen on double purpose things. And we know that at St. Paul's with the two towers, he, he, had, he had ideas about turning one of the towers into an observatory so that it could serve a dual function. But in fact, the, the telescope was too big to fit up. So, so that idea had to get aborted. But so 150 years ahead of him, this kind of thing was being designed elsewhere with, with phenomenally advanced um, vaulting techniques and, and theories of all sorts. So, so this illustration shows on the right, the interior dome of St. Paul's, and on the left, the, the Selemia Mosque in Edirne, which is 150 years earlier than, than what was, Wren was building. So you can see, you can see the parallels, the semi-domes, the use, the use of the space and, and the vaulting techniques. A couple of other buildings that Wren singles out as being of Saracen design are uh, St. Stephen's in Vienna on the left there and Strasbourg Cathedral. And he, he again, he, he's no fan of Gothic, as I'm sure you know. I mean, he talks about how everything is crooked, there are no proper right angles, it's full of all these falsely delicate ornaments. So he doesn't like that kind of style, but he does appreciate the vaulting techniques. So for me, when Notre Dame caught fire, this, this for me was literally the big spark that got me going on all of this, because the world reaction to that fire was, oh, uh, the French, you know, our national identity is going up in flames. It became clear to me that the French had appropriated all these elements of Gothic without any acknowledgement of where all these elements came from. So th this is what made me want to write the book in the first place and illustrate how pretty much every element of what we think of as Gothic architecture has in fact come from elsewhere. Every everything pretty much apart from the flying buttresses. And the other thing I discovered, so on the right there, you've got the decapitated Saint Denis, who is the patron saint of France. And one of the things I learned very quickly in my researches was that this is a medieval muddle, basically. It seemed to happen quite a lot 
um, in, in medieval times where the clergy were the people who were literate, it turns out this was actually a sort of a case of mixed identities and uh, it's ex all explained quite carefully in the book. But basically in, in France, they called Gothic the French style. It was very much appropriated because the originator of Gothic is always in pretty much every art history book you, you read, you'll find it's Saint-Denis, Saint-Denis. And the person who takes all the credit is Abbot Suger, who's put himself into the stained glass window there twice and labels himself to make certain that you know who he is. We know nothing about the people who built the building. The only reference to them is that he summoned the best craftsmen. That's all it says. And so if you look at the history books, so all the elements here, so Saint-Denis is credited as the first Gothic building. But Dennis, as I said, this decapitated saint who was very influential in medieval times and influenced Abbot Suger and who he credits with all this philosophy of light, letting in the light windows. It turns out to all be a case of mistaken identity. He was thought, Abbot Suger thought he was a disciple of St. Paul. In fact, it turns out to have been a fake. And the real Dennis, although he's called pseudo Dennis in art his history circles now, turns out to be a fifth century Syrian monk. So this is where the story takes us to Syria. And indeed in Syria, though I'm sure some of you have been there and you know for yourselves, there is this whole area of about 2000 settlements, um, which is really a microcosm of early Christian architecture from the fourth, fifth and, and sixth centuries, where you can see the beginnings of Christian architecture, because of course before that it was persecuted and, it, and there were, no churches were allowed to be built. It's, it's in a part of Syria, in the northwest, in, in the province that's now Idlib, so it's, it's under rebel control, but it's uh, only been partially damaged. But it's a limestone massif, and so the people there became immensely uh, skilled masons. I mean, stone masonry in Syria is literally as old as the hills. And in that capital that's showing there in the top right hand corner, you'll see the acanthus leaves are carved in a way to look as if they're blowing in the wind. And there's, there's one exactly like that in the nave of Notre Dame, which tells you that somebody from Syria must have worked there. So the point about what the reason why all these churches and settlements are there in Syria is because at that time, the Santiago de Compostela of its day, the key uh, pilgrimage site was St. Simeon's Basilica there on, on the right. And St. Simeon was a stylite, he preached from his pillar, and people came from all over Europe to, to hear him preaching, and so a series of churches were built along the route. And on the right there uh, is, is the remains of his stump of his pillar, and on, and on the left is, is the earliest twin towers between a monumental entrance <clears throat> that's called Kalblausi and it was designed to receive the pilgrims and that dates to 460. So then the first Muslim dynasty comes in into this Christian Byzantine world, the Umayyads, and they make Damascus their capital and for the first hundred years actually the building is shared. They, the Christians turn one direction and the Muslims turn the other and they use the same space. There's, there's no destruction at all. They actually, um, you know, they live together until they out, the population outgrows the space and then the Muslims build this mosque and in return give the Christians land for four new churches. But, but the architecture here tells you what a blended vision they had. So, so of course they built on the Byzantine Christian architecture that was there before. So that minaret is, they call it the Jesus minaret because that's a blending of the local traditions where Jesus will descend from that minaret. There's the Hellenistic uh, gable because of the sites, the Hellenistic sites they'll have seen all over Syria and there's the Byzantine dome. So they've, they've blended all that together to make something new. They, they've absorbed what was there before. And the mosaics in the uh, Umayyad mosque, again, are all this blending. So you've got Byzantine mosaicists now, but instead of making saints, 
on, on the walls like they would do in churches. They're, they're making Islamic visions of paradise, of gardens, of streams, of trees. But they've absorbed the iconography of the, the Trinity there, the three churches. So that's now part of the mosque. They've got the Hellenistic columns that they'll have seen in places like Palmyra. So it's an, it's, it's an amalgam, a kind of blend. But they invent new things along the way. And this is where it's so important to recognise this. So the Dome of the Rock, built in, in 490, is the first sort of Umayyad statement building. Uh, saying to the Christians, we have arrived as a new religion, because at the beginning they were mistaken for another his, uh, Christian heretical sect. Um, but inside the Dome of the Rock, you have the beginnings of the pointed arch, and under the dome, you have the beginnings of the trefoil arch, which become so important then in, in Gothic. And also the Umayyads start the use of a, a rose window. This is considered to be the earliest rose window in the eighth century a decorative window which had coloured glass in it that was high up in the audience chamber of the caliph and it then takes five centuries for that to evolve to the absolute peak of Chartres and its rose window there. So that's the end of the Umayyads in, in Spain, uh, in, in Syria, but of course what then happens is that the new dynasty of the Abbasids comes in, wipes out the Umayyads except for one prince and this one prince escapes across North Africa and makes it to Spain. And he sets up a new capital in Cordoba. He brings Syria to Spain and all the architectural features there are brought from Syria. So you've got the double decker arches everywhere, the two-tone arches, the, this ablak style it's called with the alternating colors. You've got the trefoil arch there on the right that series of seven above the mihrab, so you've got the use of the trefoil arch in the holiest place in the mosque. And, and this, is, this is now 10th century. The whole of the Cordoba Mesquita is covered in arches, arches everywhere. The Arab proverb says the arch never sleeps. So on the right, this is all the different types of arches on the exterior of the Cordoba Mesquita. On the left, that is the Galilee Chapel in Durham Cathedral which just copies these, these arches. And then here, this is the dome, the very earliest ribbed dome on European soil. So Wren would have loved this. Uh, this is directly above the mihrab. It's, it's built in the 10th century and it has, it's been examined by structural engineers who've pronounced it the most perfect example of geometry that they'd ever seen. And it has never needed structural repair in its thousand year existence. And at the back of the mosque, all the masons' marks have been found who, who were involved in the building. And the overwhelming majority of them are Arab names in Arabic script. So we can see that it was Arab masons who were working on this phenomenal dome. Now, so Spain is one of the main gateways, obviously, that all this is coming into Europe. Amalfi is another one. Uh, Amalfi Cathedral here. Um, the Amalfi merchants were trading with, with Cairo in a, around a, a, a thousand, um, the year 1000, and they liked the pointed arches of the Ibn Taloon Mosque. And so the bishop said, I would like to use that in my new cathedral. He had workmen sent over. They built the, the pointed arch and then uh, the abbot of Monte Cassino from the Benedictines comes to visit Amalfi, sees, sees the pointed arch and says, I want that in my um, monastery. And then Cluny, the, the abbot of Cluny, sees it in Monte Cassino and says, right, I want those pointed arches in my abbey. And the minute Cluny has got it and the powerful Benedictines, that's it. The fashion is set across Europe and everybody wants pointed arches. And then the Benedictines control the uh, pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela and start to build a series of cathedrals along the way where the Arab influence is stronger and stronger to see because they're beginning to bring in all of these influences. This is Le Puy Cathedral where I was just the other week. It even has Kufic inscriptions It has it, because they thought it was holy writing. <laughs> they didn't even know what it, what, it, what it was. They thought it was sacred writing um, from, from the Holy Land. 
So at around this time, you start to, uh, you start to get pictures in French Bibles showing things like this, of God as architect of the universe, God with his compass. Um, and the whole concept of, of the importance of geometry is now starting to come into the European mindset as, as they begin to absorb all the skills that the Muslim masons have brought in. It takes about 200 years for those skills to pass over and then you start to get them used um, in, in cathedrals. So Venice, which, which Wren identified so early on as a Saracenic building, so much borrowing from Islamic architecture. So on, on the right there, you've got the Doge's Palace. Uh, and, and again, this is the sort of thing Wren wouldn't have liked. He'd have, call it, he'd have called it covered in, in superfluous um, uh, ornaments with too much delicate profusion and, th and that sort of language is what he would have used. But um, what he didn't know was that the, uh, the Doge's Palace is actually modeled directly the ground plan of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Such was the Venetians' desire to copy what they saw in the Islamic world. And things like that telephone dial motif on the palace to the, to the left, again, is lifted straight off a palace in, in Cairo. The Venetians were very open about it. They, they loved it. They wanted to bring it over. Uh, and yet we talk about Venetian Gothic when actually we should probably be talking about Venetian Islamic. <laughs> Uh, so this, now again, Wren would have loved this. This is the wooden ceiling of the Capella Palatina in Palermo in Sicily. And we know that uh, Fatimid uh, carpenters from uh, Egypt were brought over by Roger, the Norman uh, king, uh, Roger II, to build this into the special space of his, of his chapel. And Wren would have loved it because it was self-supporting. This is 500 years before Wren built his self-supporting uh, ceiling in, in the Sheldonian. I mean, just phenomenal, the sheer, the sheer level of skill. It's almost impossible to photograph. It's so, so detailed and, and such a geometrical um, complex uh, thing of, of creation. And then finally, here on the left, we've got Burgos Cathedral, which Wren also identifies. As, as, the, uh, as, as a Saracen building. And of course, uh, seven centuries later, we have the absolute Gothic peak of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. And had Wren been alive to see that, he would have identified in it all the things he talks about as part of the, the Gothic, the fact that there are no right angles, it's all crooked. But, but Gaudi, the architect of it, also claims that this is what you want in a building. You want spatial imperfections in a building because that's where God resides. So he sets out to achieve all of that. Um, and and what, what the two men would have shared, although they didn't share this love of Gothic, what they did share was a desire to, to build for eternity. So uh, that's where I'm going to end because I'm being nodded at. <laughs> Right, okay. <laughs> okay. Next.